Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar, A Watershed Perspective on Corporate Water Stewardship. I'm Brooke Barton, Water Program Director at Ceres. We have an amazing turnout for this event, over 300 people registered, and this topic of why and how companies can play a more active role in solving watershed issues. Well, it's hugely important, uh, it's timely, and as we are seeing in countless geographies across the globe, there is a really urgent need for new approaches to addressing water challenges whether it's in California or Brazil or northern China. So before we get started with our event, I wanted to share just a few logistical details. This is a one-hour webinar, and we're recording it, and we'll provide the link to the recording after the session. Uh, we want to hear from you during this event, and we will be taking questions via the chat functions at different points in the webinar. Uh, we'll be asking you to share questions for Jerry Lynch from, the, from General Mills uh, after he speaks, and also in the last 10 minutes of the webinar. We're going to be joined today by a really great group of experts. We'll chat first, as I said, with Jerry Lynch, Chief Sustainability Officer at General Mills, on the company's journey on water stewardship. Next, we're going to talk to Nathan Carras, freshwater scientist from the Nature Conservancy, and Ellen Silva, Senior Manager for Applied Sustainability at General Mills, on how their two organizations are working together to develop watershed strategies. So for any of you who don't know Ceres, my organization, we're a nonprofit working to catalyze sustainability leadership with companies and investors. We work with over 100 investors with collective assets of around $12 trillion to help them more deeply analyze and address sustainability risks like water scarcity and climate change in their investment process. We also have a company network, which General Mills is a member of. Through that, we are bringing companies together with outside stakeholders so they can hear unvarnished but constructive feedback on their sustainability progress. We bring these dialogues, into these dialogues, experts from the environmental and human rights uh, worlds, investors, shareholders, uh, members of labor unions, academics, the whole gamut. So General Mills has worked with its series stakeholder team for about the past eight years, hearing from these stakeholders being asked some tough questions, and taking a lot of it on in the name of more deeply integrating sustainability into the business. And I would say this is especially true when it comes to their journey on water and their work in their supply chain. So we're going to hear more about that journey soon, but I wanted to share just a bit about what we've seen at Ceres in the past several years in terms of the sort of changes that are happening right now and how companies are addressing water issues and water risk. Um, you know, about five years ago, it became for us at Ceres extremely clear that water risks of various kinds, physical risks, issues of scarcity or quality, reputational or social license to operate issues, regulatory concerns related to water, that they're all becoming a lot more financially material for companies in a range of sectors. And because of climate change, you know, the reason for this is because of climate change, population growth, bigger demands on resources, inequality to access to water in the developing world, um, and well, let's face it, in a lot of places, the fact that we have pretty poor public management of water. Um, so these issues are mounting, and we aren't really sure, we weren't really sure at that time if the existing approaches that companies are taking to dealing with these issues was really up to the scale of the challenge. Um, we interviewed um, dozens of companies to understand where things needed to go, um, and they confirmed a lot of our suspicions. Most of the, these managers, uh, in a range of sectors felt that the traditional uh, EMS orientation to water management with its, you know, very laudable focus on efficiency, compliance, continuous improvement, it just wasn't sufficient. And, and why was that? Well, because it was disconnected from the scale of these risks. Um, to borrow a phrase from um, my colleague Kate Lamb at the CDP, it does you no good to be a clean fish in a dirty pond or a dry pond, right? Um, collective mismanagement of water hurts everyone eventually. So ultimately, we have to figure out how to clean the pond together. A lot of the sustainability managers we talked to at that time also recognized that they lacked tools to manage risks in their supply chain, particularly agricultural supply chains. They weren't so certain that in a warming, more water-constrained world, they'd necessarily be able to hedge their way out of things like commodity price risk or even ensure con continuity of supply at, at any price. So company managers are... We're starting to look outside their factory walls, beginning to look down their supply chains and into the watersheds that they depend on to help foster bigger solutions. But making this switch isn't very easy for a lot of companies, and it requires working with new sets of data, new stakeholders, new partners, and selling the need for a different approach inside your company. And that's one of the reasons we at Ceres developed a tool called the AquaGage, which has been used by hundreds of companies to look at the maturity and robustness of their water stewardship approach. 
It looks at water management holistically, at how water issues are governed in the company, how well data is being collected, what kind of performance targets are being set, what kind of supply chain policies you have, and of course, how are you engaging with the watershed level. The tool gives you a chance to chart out and visualize the maturity of your water management on a sliding scale from no action to leading practice across about 20 different management aspects. It's really the perfect tool for starting a conversation internally, uh, getting stakeholders internally uh, at the table to discuss these issues, and prioritizing action. It's also, I want to just stress, pretty easy to use and free. Um, so, you know, when we created the AquaGage a few years ago, watershed strategies by companies were really, a, it was a fairly novel concept. There weren't that many examples. A uh, few companies were implementing them or even considering them. And I think a lot, at that time, too, a lot of investors didn't understand the value they played in mitigating risk for the companies in their portfolio. Uh, I think that's shifting, and we're at a, a real tipping point now. Um, so that's why I want to bring Jerry Lynch now into this conversation, CSO of General Mills. Jerry, as I mentioned, you know, about eight years ago, when General Mills first joined the series network, the company was strongly focused on conserving water in the factory, within the fence line, and was really c successful at that, um, really saw conservation as well as compliance at its, as its core responsibility. Um, but I think you might say today that the, this has shifted, and that this, while conservation internally is critical, it's not sufficient. Um, can you tell us about why the company's view has changed? I'd be happy to. Good morning, and good morning to everybody on the webinar from a chilly Minneapolis, Minnesota. You know, when we look at our business model at the highest level, we take the output of Mother Nature and we transform it in ways that are relevant for consumers today to get the nutrition they need in the midst of their busy lives, and then we sell it to them. And so if that engine of Mother Nature breaks down, our business model's in a world of hurt. And um, it really started, as you talked about, Brooke, within our own fall, four walls where we have the most control and we've been working on that steadily since 2005. Uh, but we understood that because our business model is so encompassed and so dependent on the continued health of Mother Nature, we really needed to understand the big picture. So if you think about our business model, we take ingredients, we transform them into products that are relevant for consumers' lives, we transport them typically to a retail customer. Um, retailers hold that for some period of time and then in the case of many products, those products are transformed in the consumer's home. But what we understood when we did the footprinting of our full value chain, first of all, if you transform that picture into what our carbon footprint looks like, the vast majority of that ends up in agriculture. Um, and so that was very eye-opening for us. Um, we knew intuitively that was true, but the dimension of it was very helpful for us to understand. And then secondly, if you look at that from a water perspective, you can see that the vast majority of it, and this is the next slide, 99% um, of the water footprint of our entire value chain, a billion cubic meters of water every year, is up in agriculture and in the production of the ingredients that go into our products. So it was really that understanding that led us on this journey to understand the, in more detail the risks and opportunities to address the challenge of water stewardship. Thanks, Jerry. And, you know, it's really interesting to see on Wednesday your CEO announced a new corporate water policy. Uh, what, what is this policy about? What was it, why was it something that the company felt they needed to, to do? It's really a framework to guide our um, engagement and work externally because this work is going to really require collaboration at levels never seen before. Internally, we like to call it uber collaboration because we're, it, it really is going to require a lot of people working in each watershed in order to make a difference. So what this does is two major things. It guides our internal and our external action, and it includes advocacy. Um, it helps us focus on efficiency and responsibility within our own facilities, for sure. Um, it addresses the fact that we're going to have to collaborate with stakeholders, including our suppliers, in order to make a difference here. Um, it outlines how this pro process is going to be governed within the company, 
we're blessed to have a governance committee that's chaired by our CEO, and we meet with them on a regular basis to review policy and progress against our sustainability work. It also talks about how we're going to have to invest wisely as we make business decisions. Where, for instance, are we going to put facilities and how we think about that in water-stressed areas. Um, and then to be part of advocating for effective, efficient policy that, uh, in places where that makes sense. Um, we signed on to the CEO water mandate. Um, we'll be reporting our water footprint annually. We think that's part of the process because collaboration here is going to be so important. Thanks, Jerry. And you know, I, I think that a lot of folks thinking about these issues, and, and maybe those who are kind of outside of industry and listening in here today, um, might assume that it would be pretty natural for for a big company like General Mills um, and others in the sector to really address some of these issues or manage these risks, not by kind of digging in and getting involved, but by finding a new place to source uh, or a different place to, to site your facilities. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you think about your risks and, and why, why your focus is on, on digging in and, and getting involved versus uh, sort of hedging and, and, and moving your, your exposure? There are a lot of factors to consider um, when we look at where we source and how we source from, particularly when we look forward to increasing demand, feeding a population of 9 billion, feeding many more middle-income consumers who will likely want protein-intensive diets, faced with declining resources and quality resources in order to provide the food security that the world needs. So we look at a lot of things, alternatives, uh, the people involved, the costs, um, assets that we have in place. And oftentimes it's just as cost effective to stay in the same place and as you put it, dig in and do the work there. In some cases we have other infrastructure like production facilities tied to a particular watershed so it's important that we take care of those assets. Uh, the communities depend on it as do our shareholders. In some cases other alternatives are limited due to suitable climate or where the history of production is and how quickly um, other alternatives might be able to ramp up. I think cocoa is a, a good example of that, where 70% of the world's cocoa is in just a couple countries in West Africa. Um, and increasingly, moving doesn't solve the problem long term, because eventually as a society, we're going to run out of productive area. And so we've got to address um, these challenges in the areas where they're occurring today. No, absolutely, and I think the, the slide we're seeing here of sort of the, the map of General Mills facilities and key growing regions across the globe really does tell that story. Um, we, we can't really, we can't hedge our way out of this. We actually need to deal with it. Um, so I wanted to shift uh, topics a little bit. Um, you know, Jerry, you've had a, a, a long career in General Mills. A lot of that time you were working in the supply chain area, and your whole group reports up to the senior vice president of supply chain in the company. I, I think there's probably a lot of people uh, on the line from companies wondering how on earth do they convince their procurement teams to actually look at these issues, sustainability, water risk, more, a little bit more seriously, especially when, you know, the typical performance objectives have been really shaped around metrics like cost and quality. Yeah, well, it, it goes back to the way that we view this challenge um, and th what it means for our overall business model. And the only way we're going to continue to succeed well into the future, as our shareholders want and as all of our stakeholders want, is for us to be able to run the com company sustainably. But we are a food company. We're not a sustainability company. And so what that means is that sustainability efforts have to be integrated into everyday business decision making so that these considerations are one of many factors that are taken into consideration. So one of the things that we've done is just made the business case internally and externally. Last year, we announced that we would be, that we're working towards sustainably sourcing our 10 priority ingredients by 2020. And you can see on the slide what those ingredients are. Many of these have water challenges associated with them. And the only way we're going to be able to do this work is to bring suppliers and farmers and agriculture with us. 
as you saw, the vast majority of our water footprint is up in agriculture. So we're going to have to help them understand the same business case that we understand. Um, and it starts as an imperative, but there's really a lot of opportunity for innovation that creates value for all parties involved. We look at this and look for ways to increase farmer profitability, to stabilize costs for our own supply chain, to improve quality for our consumers. There's lots of things, lots of value that will be created as we get further into integrating this work in agriculture and along the full value, our full value chain. Great. No, thank you, Jerry. And now I, I think we're going to turn it over to some questions we have from, from the audience, people who have come in through the chat. Um, so one, one uh, question we have here uh, is that uh, this comes from Caitlin. She says, now that Walmart is talking about fertilizer optimization as part of their sustainable sourcing strategy, how, that, how might that impact agricultural suppliers and companies like, like General Mills? And, and just to clarify, you know, um, fertilizer runoff um, is, in agriculture is one of the, the largest contributors to impaired water quality in our country and in a lot of different places. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, um, Jerry, the, the, the Walmart focus now on, on fertilizer? Yeah, happy to. Um, and obviously, uh, they're a key customer of ours, and we partner with them in this work. Um, we made an announcement together this past spring to expand one of the key programs that we're using in a number of our agricultural ingredients in that 2020 commitment. Um, it's an initiative called Field to Market, and it, is a, it has all the, the uh, players along the value chain involved with it, working with farmers to help them make more sustainable and more profitable choices for themselves. One of the key areas that that focuses on is optimizing the use of fertilizer uh, in the value chain. And that has actually two impacts. Um, excessive fertilizer not only can leach into waterways and create a water quality problem, but it can also um, denitrify up into the air, and it's a powerful greenhouse gas when it turns into nitrous oxide. So we care about both of those things as we do this work. Um, and so enabling farmers to uh, make the link between more sustainable choices, like optimizing their, their fertilizer utilization, reduces their footprint, but typically it also reduces the amount of fertilizer that they use, and so it... Uh, enables them to save money, and so it's more profitable for them um, to get the same yields. One of the areas where this is tied very directly to water use is um, vegetable growing that uh, is done for us in Mexico um, by around 200 farmers, and uh, these farmers typically were using furrow ir irrigation in the past, and we've provided them with no interest loans over the past five years to convert to drip irrigation. One of the benefits of that is it dramatically cuts their water use almost in half, but at the same time it allows them to use fertilizer much more efficiently because it allows them to apply the fertilizer right on the root of the, of the plant. Um, and so it's much more efficient use of, of that of that fertilizer. So there's lots of value like this that we unlock um, as this work is done in agriculture. Right, and, and I think it's, it's great to see um, you know, companies like General Mills getting involved in the supply chain, efforts like Field to Market that are helping companies or, or farmers begin to, to measure this, inform this information. Um, and certainly Walmart, the Walmart push always plays an interesting role in all of these supply chain efforts. Um, so I have another question here from, um, from Mark. He says, I'm very excited about corporations making commitments to procuring more sustainable corn. And an even greater opportunity lies in shifting crops from corn to things like pasture for livestock or intermediate wheat grass or recently bred perennial grass. Um, how do you see General Mills potentially shifting some cropland to crops like that? Um, are, are you guys, I guess another way of asking, are you guys thinking about using grains that have um, perhaps uh, less overall environmental or water-related impacts? Yeah, so the, I think the, the, the best way to look at that is um, our products are built around uh, a certain um, grain structure. 
Um, and as we do design work, that certainly will be a consideration. Um, we don't use a lot of corn in our in our products. Um, we have a pretty small um, corn portfolio. It's one of the reasons why um, in our portfolio there's in our 10 by 20, um, it's really just dry milled corn that, that we're focused on. Um, so I'm sure that'll be a consideration um, in the future as we get further into designing for sustainability. Great. Um, and I, I have a, a question here, I think our final question um, uh, from Ryan, who says, um, many of your inputs are commodity crops that are aggregated at a massive scale. Um, how are you thinking about giving incentives to producers for better agricultural water management in commodity supply chains? In two ways, really. One is, um, as I mentioned before, the work in field to market is to demonstrate to farmers that more sustainable choices can be more profitable choices. So as they're doing the measurement, which is part of what field to market brings to the table, our engagement with these growers then um, involves workshops with them that allows them to see the impact as well as the not only environmental impact but also the dollar impact of the choices that they're making and the impacts that that has on their yields. But then to bring innovation to the table um, that will enable them to make more sustainable choices. Um, along with Walmart, we sponsored an innovation challenge that leverages our innovation capabilities this past fall to identify tools that are best in class for farmers to use in optimizing their, um, their use of nitrogen fertilizer, for instance. Um, and we'll be bringing those tools, those best-in-class tools, to these farmer workshops so that they can uh, take advantage of that. Um, so that's one way is, is the direct grower engagement. The second way is really how we're engaging in watershed stewardship, um, watershed by watershed. It really is at the, at the watershed level that this work has to be done. That's the operating unit, if you will, for uh, making a difference in water stewardship for the long term. Um, and I'm sure um, Ellen will talk about that more later on in the, in the webinar here this morning. No, that's perfect. That's a perfect segue, um, Jerry. Thank you so much, and thanks for all these great questions that have come in. Um, so, yeah, the watershed is the operating unit to make a big difference. That w that's what we're hearing. Uh, I now want to bring in yeah, Nathan and Ellen into the discussion. So first, Nathan Carr is freshwater scientist at the Nature Conservancy. Nathan, I hear from people working on local water issues that we definitely need more stakeholders at the table to, to deal with some of the big entrenched challenges, and, and we need different kinds of stakeholders, particularly business. Um, but let's face it, there's often um, you know, long-standing conflicts and, and challenges over water that can make it maybe not totally appealing for a company to want to get involved. Um, so, so given that, wh you know, why are companies like General Mills starting to get involved and from your perspective, and, and what role is the Nature Conservancy playing in, in helping them do that? Uh, first, I want to say thank you, Brooke, and to Ceres for this opportunity to join this conversation. Um, and good morning to everybody else on the line. If you could go back to the thank you, previous slide. Uh, so it's, it's a common refrain that sort of water is a, a source of conflict. And some of my first work in the water landscape had to do with transboundary river management, which is one of those water topics that frequently comes up in presentations about the sort of doom and gloom of water resources and lots of warfare and conflict. And while there certainly are cases where these transboundary rivers can be a major source of conflict between countries, and more often we see examples of cooperation and collaboration. And so similarly, while it isn't always the case, in my own experience in working with companies, I've seen that businesses recognize the importance of working together to really address our, our most uh, impressing water challenges, and that shared rather than competing interests really do dominate the conversations. So if we expand the view to include other stakeholders, uh, it's also clear that companies recognize the importance of collaboration for really creating impact at scale, that, uh, that operating unit that Jerry just spoke about, really creating impact that we can see across the basin. And so there are just too many interests to really go it alone. And so a key role that we see leading companies like General Mills play is really bringing other private sector actors to the water stewardship table that previously m maybe haven't been there. As for the role of TNC, on the Nature Conservancy, we have a long history of working with a variety of partners, you know, from our traditional roots in land conservation, working with individual landowners, to government agencies, to other NGOs, and to the private sector. 
And so building from our core capabilities in conservation and water science, we, we work to leverage our relationships to help connect companies with stakeholders across the spectrum. You know, we also have the, the advantage of leveraging our expertise and experience of really working on the ground in 50 st all 50 states in the U.S. and 35 countries across the world. And so through this work, we're able to offer examples of some of the sort of conservation solutions, some of which Jerry has mentioned already, uh, some of these solutions to our most pressing water challenges. And then I'd say the last thing is perhaps most importantly, uh, we work to make connections to on-the-ground investments that directly reduce the, these company water risks, but while also supporting our, our mission of protecting the lands and waters on which life depends. Great. Well, thanks, Nathan. I mean, we're going to hear more about those particular solutions and some of those watersheds in a minute. But I want to ask Alan first, Alan Silva, Senior Manager for Applied Sustainability at General Mills, um, you know, who's really leading up this work internally at General Mills. You know, uh, companies, I think, are, are hearing quite a lot these days from their investors um, through the CDP and other, other ways, uh, asking them to assess and disclose their water risks. Um, and I'm sure that's easier asked than done. Um, so I, I wanted to see if you could just give us a little bit of an overview of how you guys went about understanding your water risks and, and how did you prioritize? Yeah, I sure would be happy to do that, Brooke. And thanks, I'll add my thanks to Nathan's for um, convening this webinar. Um, it is a daunting task when you think about a global scale corporation operating in m many, many facilities across the globe. How do you get to First, what is the risk? And second, what in the heck are we going to do about the risk? You saw this map earlier when Jerry referenced how we got going on our journey. Um, and it really was an important early step in, in the journey that we've taken to watershed stewardship. Our strategy is built on um, long, long practice General Mills approach of assessing a situation, developing a strategy, analyzing and action planning that, that situation, and then transforming the situation b b through your action plan into a solution. The, the big add on watershed stewardship is uh, the, recognition, the recognition that collaboration is absolutely essential. Um, in some of our watersheds, we use 0.2% of the water that is being used in that watershed. So if we could do everything right, we'd be just like you, you mentioned before, Brooke, we'd be that, that uh, fish in the dry pond. That's not gonna work. Nature Conservancy has been a critical partner for us as we've explored this. Um, we began by asking them to do a global assessment of all of our facilities and about 15 of our critical growing regions for water stress to help us understand just where were we really in the most trouble. Then if you'll go ahead and advance to the next slide, what we did with that output, because still it's a very daunting um, task when we looked at all the, the areas that, that popped up as hotspots, 15 at high risk of water stress. How do we get to a manageable number that we can actually start working on? Well, we applied what was material to General Mills to that assessment. We applied criteria such as which of those facilities were absolutely critical to our future success um, in a big way. Uh, uh, we consider all of our facilities important, of course, but some produce a much larger share of our product. Which facilities use a much larger amount of water? You know, it may not be as critical to uh, worry about water supply for a flour mill, for instance, where you're trying to keep everything dry to begin with. Um, versus a plant that makes soup, for instance. Using that material assessment, we were able to prioritize eight watersheds to start our, our work. And even at eight watersheds, we could not work on all of them at once. So we've started one after another. We currently have a detailed assessment completed on our Irapuato facility, thanks to the Nature Conservancy. We're well on our way um, to assessments in California and Albuquerque. We have, we have a, a great assessment on the Snake River as well. Nathan's gonna tell you a lot more about those watersheds where we've advanced the work the furthest at this point. One of the advantages of taking this step-by-step -step approach, not only is it digestible, but we're learning with each watershed. We're learning how to do it better the next time. So, um, 
you eat an elephant by taking one bite at a time, I think is the, uh, the, summary, of, the summary answer to your question, Brooke. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, let's all keep that image of elephant eating in our mind not too long. Um, <laughs> and I want, to, uh, I want to throw it back to Nathan because he's going to talk us, to us about some of those priority watersheds you mentioned, Ellen, uh, and, and what's actually going on in those regions and, and why it's so important to, to take action. Yeah, thanks, Brooke. So as Ellen mentioned, we're conducting de these detailed risk assessments in at least eight different basins. Um, and today I'm just going to re review a subset of those. So I've pulled out Central Mexico, Idaho, and California to present some of the challenges and opportunities for translating this global risk picture that, that Jerry presented in, in one of his slides and how we translate that into action at the local scale. So just a quick caveat that much of this work is really a result of efforts of my TNC colleagues and, and others at the global, regional, and local levels. And this is going to be a high-level overview that's going to gloss over many details. So apologies in advance to those of you on the line who are a little bit more technically minded. So one of the first detailed risk assessments that we conducted was in the Mexican state of Guanajuato. It's just shown in the map here in the upper left. And General Mills has had a Green Giant processing facility in the city of Arapuato since at least 1983. And Green Giant contracts out to farmers in the region for vegetables that it processes at that, processes at that plant. And General Mills has strong relationships working directly with the growers that produce those vegetables for that facility. So what are the challenges and opportunities here? So the biggest challenge for Arapuato is really focused on one statistic, and that's two meters per year. And that's the average rate of aquifer decline uh, for, for, the, un, un, for groundwater in the region. And groundwater supplies most of the water for irrigation for farmers there. And the climate in the Bajio region, uh, this is in central Mexico, is semi-arid and farmers depend heavily on irrigation for the crop produ productivity. So at this rate of abstraction or groundwater withdrawal, it's anticipated that critical groundwater levels could be reached within just a few decades. So this is really a critical and paramount issue. There are other challenges um, that pertaining to groundwater quality, the effects of climate change, and, and there are also important challenges of capacity and governance in the area, particularly regarding the enforcement of well permitting and regulation. So the, but the overlying opportunity question for Rapunzel really is, is how can we decrease that uh, rate of withdrawal from the aquifer? Right. And, and uh, Nathan, it, just se it seems like the groundwater issues are, are central in so many agricultural regions, and, and we're seeing more and more data coming out you know, from NASA and elsewhere just showing how quickly some of these aquifers are in decline. Um, is, that, is that an issue in some of these other geographies you guys have looked at? That's, that's a great question. So in Idaho, General Mills is, is interested in the Upper Snake River Basin, which is shown in the map on the upper left here. And this is one of the most productive agricultural regions in the country. And General Mills is one of the biggest purchasers and sourcers of wheat in the region. And so, but there are many other important crops, including potatoes and sugar beets, and many and those are often grown in rotation with wheat, um, barley and alfalfa for the rapidly growing dairy industry there. But in contrast to Arapato, where I just talked about the, the, ground, the aquifer being the, the kind of primary and really the only focus of our, or major focus of our efforts, um, in Idaho, we're also focused on surface water is also an important supply, but perhaps even more importantly is connections between those two sources. So just as an example, an aquifer connected spring in one, in a, spring that depends on aquifer and the groundwater flows can discharge water into the Snake River, which is then used downstream by surface water irrigators. So you have this direct connection and coupling between that surface water and groundwater system. We see this see connections across the basin. Another difference between Irapuato and Idaho is that there's already a strong water management structure that is responding to some of these major water challenges, and so that's really an important opportunity there. As far as the biggest challenge, um, the, the graph in the upper right shows the similar sort of trajectory of groundwater that you may see in, like you mentioned, in the GRACE and NASA satellite imagery uh, of tracking of groundwater withdrawals across the world, the sort of a general trajectory of a decline. But in, in contrast to, to Idaho, the east, eastern snake plain aquifer, in terms of total absolute volume, is really immense. It's roughly the size of Lake Erie. So groundwater irrigators could really continue to pump water for many decades or even centuries before depleting it. But even so, we're already seeing that major wa the water users are being impacted through a sort of chain reaction, which is depicted in the, the, the lower the figure there. And this, this is causing uh, what is known as the threat of curtailment. And in simple terms, this is just the threat of having water users having to shut off their groundwater pumping uh, due to priority, water rights priority enforcement. 
So that's a, that's a long answer to your question, but so in, in Idaho, yes, groundwater does matter. But the more important and perhaps the more accurate opportunity question is, is how do we stabilize aqu aquifer level, levels without neg negatively affecting the rest of the system? Right, and how do, how do we maintain production for the real long term in areas like this? Um, so I another, know, know that another area, Nathan, that you guys are looking at is, is California. And, you know, with the drought and, and the, certainly the, the traditional conflicts over water in California between the north and the south and, and farmers and cities, uh, and the huge role, of course, that California plays in, in food production in our country, um, the state's really a litmus test for the question of whether we can come up with a more collaborative solution for, for dealing with these issues. Um, tell us about what you guys are doing there and, what, and what's the situation. Sure. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, so, so one of the key things we learned in Mexico and Idaho, and, and Ellen, it was great to point out that this is a, a learning process, and this is really is a journey, and or it's a little bit of trial and error, he, trial and error here. So, uh, we've we've learned quite quick. We've learned through those experiences that our mantra now really is to engage with others early and often, and I can't. I can't really stress that enough, and this is especially important in California where we see a nexus of a whole portfolio of water challenges and everything is at a really large scale and there's just an immense amount of complexity there. And so that collaboration piece is really key, and so we've engaged with folks really early on there. So a, a quick high-level background in the California water picture, and I'm sure many of the folks on the line already have a pretty good understanding of the water challenges there. Much like Idaho, water supply in California depends both on surface water, and the map on the left is just some, shows precipitation levels, um, and then also groundwater, which is shown on the map on the right, which shows aquifers, major aquifers in the region. And most of the surface water originates in Northern California and the Sierras, and then is transported to water users in Central and Southern California. But often when you're looking at a specific city or you're looking at a specific facility, in the case of General Mills, you see that multiple sources are connected through an extensive water infrastructure network, and that's shown in the, in the, in the middle map there. And there's also exports from the Colorado River Basin, which are also an important supply source. Groundwater, which is the other major water supply source, uh, accounts for roughly a third of the total water supply on, on an, in an average year. Uh, in dry years, though, it can count to up to two-thirds. So again, both of these sources are really important, and there's also connectivity between them. So that's the sort of high 40,000-foot view of water supply in California. But it's... But the really important piece related to our conversation today is about water use and estimates of water use, that's water withdrawals, were recently released by the USGS just this past summer. And in those figures, we see that more than 74% of withdrawals are used to support irrigated agriculture. And this is for some of the most productive farmland in the world, mounting to more than, I think, somewhere in the range of $40 billion in annual sales. So General Mills, through its through the crops it is sources, including tree nuts and tomatoes, but other major food and beverage companies have a major stake, in, 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 and others as well, have a major stake in ensuring reliable water supply for agricultural production. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so what are our major challenges and opportunities in California? In our work with General Mills, we're still developing our understanding of the, we're doing that detailed risk assessment that Ellen mentioned. Um, but from our colleagues in TNC and others, we, we already have a pretty good idea of what some of the major challenges are. I'm not going to go into these figures in detail other than just to provide, provide a kind of high-level overview of some of the major physical water risks. And I just want to stress that this is just looking at the physical water risk piece and that there's other important policy and, and regulatory hurdles that are important, including the administration of water rights like most Western water states. So looking at the challenges in the upper left is a graph displaying the average annual precipitation since the beginning of the last century. And looking at the five-year tr uh, running trend line, which is that red line, we can see that this current drought that California is currently experiencing is the worst in recent history. So it's, and this covers more than 90% of the state and in, in, is rated in severe or worse levels of drought. And there's estimated direct costs related to this, particularly for the agricultural sector, in excess of about $1.5 billion. On the lower left is a chart that shows the cumulative change in groundwater. And so we're in all-time historic lows in most of the state and in many areas, particularly the San Joaquin Valley, which is important for a number of uh, agricultural dependent com companies. Um, we see that groundwater levels have dropped roughly, at, at more, in some places, more than 100 feet below historic lows. 
And the top right is something that's particularly important to my own organization, which has a focus on conservation. And we see that if you look at the, there are significant impacts of water use on both fish and other aquatic wildlife. Here it's just shown fish, the decline of fish species in California or potential risk or risks facing fish species in California. So we see that 83% of California's freshwater species or fish species are extinct or at risk of becoming so in, in the coming decades. And then the bottom right figure is, is, is that, well, to use a metaphor that's already been used a little bit here, the, it's sort of the elephant in the closet. And this is that climate change piece. And so if you overlay climate change on top of all of this, you can really see that these, these challenges really compound. And it's, 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 it presents a considerable amount of complexity, and, 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 but also opportunity. As as there's opportunities, there are several that come out of this, this complicated landscape. Tell us a little bit then, Nathan, about um, you know where you guys are in each of these three areas. Uh, where you know what where, what's the status of the projects? What are some of the the, the solutions that you're you're starting to think might might be um, uh, really key in these areas? That's a great question because at the end of the day, we we don't want to just create another series of reports on water challenges. It's, compelling and interesting though they might be, especially for a water-minded nerd like myself. But what we're doing in these deep dive assessments is really looking for the strategic opportunities for businesses to take action. And so that's, that's a key point there. And, and so much like we see divergent challenges in these, each of these three locations, we also see different opportunities to, take, to bring these, this knowledge that we're gaining into action on the ground. So in central Mexico, in Arapato, we're fortunate that, as Jerry mentioned, General Mills facility there has already been engaging in some very proactive projects, including innovative no-interest financing for growers to install drip irrigation, uh, watershed restoration efforts, including tree planting. But we need to increase participation in, in these types of efforts. And General Mills and their growers account for just a small proportion of overall water use. So again, it's, you know, they're... It, they're, they're kind of a small fish in that pond. And so it's going to take a number of actors to really come together to really create impact at scale. And so building from our scoping efforts and stakeholder outreach, Jenner Mills has partnered with the FEMSA Foundation and TNC to identify where we can specifically implement some of the, whether it's conservation practices that TNC as an organization has sort of helped develop and helped understand and apply, um, but, but other measures too, uh, including the drip irrigation pieces. And this is really to achieve to really identify where exactly can we find the opportunities for achieving the maximum benefit from doing these kind of on-the-ground investments. In Idaho, we have the advantage of strong state institutions, as I mentioned. But a key stakeholder that has largely been absent from these conversations has been the private sector. So one avenue that we are pursuing is really leveraging General Mills' private sector relationships and more importantly, the relationships and credibility with growers on the ground. And part of this is through that field to market work that Jerry talked about earlier in the presentation. And, and really want to see how the private sector can support investments in improved irrigation practices. And these are targeted to specific geographies that can support the state's water management goals. So looking forward in, in Idaho, TNC, TNC is supporting a partner of state-backed um, Part, is a part a supporting partner of a state backed proposal into NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and that could really help kickstart some of this on the ground practice work and get it moving forward. In California, we have been building from an initial meeting of companies and other stakeholders that was originally facilitated by uh, the CEO, CEO Water Mandate through the Water Action Hub. And building from this meeting and with the support of General Mills, we've been facilitating ongoing conversations between companies and NGOs and other stakeholders. <coughs> Excuse me. And laying the groundwork for, we're really working to lay the groundwork for a more formal collaboration uh, of this group. At this stage, we're, we're really focused on expanding participation to include more companies. And so I'm going to take advantage of time on this call to extend an open invitation to if there are representatives from companies that are interested in engaging in this conversation to please get in touch with us. Um, and we're formalizing the operational framework of this group. And so this is that, that key collaboration early and often that we're really trying to tap into in California to really help us get a clear understanding of where are the strategic inroads and, and where can we best move forward with this work. But it's early days in California. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for, for walking us through this. And, and maybe just give us a few more of the lessons learned and takeaways that other companies should be thinking about as they consider venturing into this sort of work. 
Sure. Thanks. Uh, it, so if we look across these geographies and our partnerships with, with partnership with General Mills, we, I, I can see at least, I can see several themes emerge. So I just but I've just pulled out a, a few of the key ones here. And so the first thing, and I'm sure this is is quite obvious at this point, but the, the context really does matter. And so if you're looking at that basin unit, that watershed unit, each watershed is really different and the solutions in one location, if you just take them sort of wholesale and try to put them into another location, may not be the best fit or may actually be counterproductive. So in the case of the upper Snake River Basin, if you're not doing it in a very planned and strategic way, if you take irrigation efficiency and start working with growers and doing all that great work, maybe doing variable rate irrigation or something along those lines, you may actually exacerbate the water balance problem there. The other key point is, is collaboration, and it's, it's an ongoing theme, but that's because it's very important. Um, but in particular, I, I, the trailer point I want to bring out is that we've seen strong enthusiasm by a number of companies managing a range of sectors, but especially in the food and beverage industries. Um, they have a strong enthusiasm for participation in water stewardship. And so one of the, the big hurdles in these different watershed locations is getting a handle on what are the water challenges and identifying those opportunities, that sort of deep dive risk assessment process that I talked about. But I think by, by companies engaging early on, they can really co coalesce the resources and get a, a head start in jumping in and understanding where exactly they can best make investments on the ground. And the, and the last piece, and this is a, an idea that TNC has been thinking a lot about lately, is, is how we can transfer these frameworks of, of collaboration from one location to another. And, and so while particular project activities or interventions and on-the-ground activities may not be transferable, we really do see that these partnerships and these collaborations, you know, they take a considerable amount of time to gain the trust and build those relationships, but those can be a great inroad into really getting activities and investments going quickly on the ground in other locations. Wow, thank you, Nathan. You really took us through a lot of material, and, and I think we'll have some probably follow-up questions from some folks on the line uh, in a bit. But I wanted to now just switch the questions, switch the question over to Ellen. Um, you know, listening to this, um, there, there's there's a lot of big ambitions in terms of how you can influence these watersheds over time. Um, but what does success really look like for General Mills? I mean, what are you guys measuring or hoping to measure in terms of the success for the initiative when you need to come to, when it comes time to report to your stakeholders, to executive management, or the board? Are there financial metrics that you can link the, this work to eventually, or risks in particular that you're you're tracking? I, I think people would love to just get a sense of how are you measuring. That's a great question, and uh, believe me, General Mills is a company that loves to measure. As we look at watershed stewardship, we're realizing we need to apply some different metric standards than we might in, um, say, a product P&L statement. But it does come down to, are we able to continue in a thriving business? Um, the first step of measurement really is have you done the risk assessment? That would be the first call out I have to anybody listening on the line. At least get started on your risk assessments. Understand what your challenges are and whether your business really is threatened. Um, once you have that in hand, you've actually learned a lot about what you can start to do to solve the problems. And measuring success in each of the basins where we learned through our risk assessment that we do have challenges is going to be different in each of those basins. A metric I would love to see um, come out of uh, the work that we are getting going in central Mexico is has the aquifer stabilized? What depth is that? Uh, are the various aquifers that feed into that region? Um, how, how far below the surface are they? Are they stabilized? Are they even coming back? That would be a very powerful signal of success. In Idaho, success to me looks like all the water users have access to the water they need when they need it. Um, in California, we have not gotten to a point where I can really tell you what success looks like. Overall, success to me is that the farmers and our facilities have the water they need in the quantity they need it without impacting the water needs of the communities and ecosystems that surround them. Um, we're early in this journey, and as we develop the journey, as we continue down the path, you can bet we'll have much, much more uh, granular metrics to go on those business notes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll look forward to that, Ellen. And, and I wanted to see if you wanted to share a little bit more about the water policy um, that was released last week. Jerry had talked about it briefly. Could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what exactly General Mills is committing itself to do through the policy? 
Yeah, I sure would, if we could advance to the next slide then. Um, the policy isn't so much a, a grand new statement of new workflows, new, new goals and, and approaches to water stewardship. It's really a gathering up of all the work that we've been doing in our facilities. Our facilities have been doing great work to improve their efficiency in collaborations with suppliers, um, you know, to improve our supply chain um, water risk uh, security or water security, um, and to make sure that we're not having a negative impact on the environment. The reason that we need a policy, if it's, if it's not bringing that much new, what is new, by the way, is the advocacy piece. We're, we're going to be a little more out in front of you folks, for instance, talking to you today. Um, but if we haven't changed that much more, why do we need a policy? Jerry referenced it. It helps us build trust with our collaborators. It's a framework for how we're going to work on this challenge, and I believe that if you explain to other people how you are going to work on it, it makes it much easier for them to join in with you and do that work together. Um, we are committing to explaining the progress we make along this watershed stewardship journey, and I think that's an important piece of accountability that we now have. Um, but most, most important to me is going right back to the theme you've heard throughout this webinar. It's a framework that's going to promote Uber collaboration, both internally and externally. Wonderful. Well put. Thank you so much, Alan. And, um, you know, we're going to open up to uh, more uh, incoming questions in just a minute. Um, while we're getting some of our questions sorted out, I wanted to, to pose a final question to Jerry. Um, We've heard uh, a lot about collaboration, okay? Uh, that's definitely the theme here. And, um, but, but I think there is sometimes a need to go beyond voluntary action. Um, I mean, we, we, we know it, it sounds from some of the, the examples we've been given today and kind of what many of us know about water issues, that there are some gaps in terms of the, the quality of the regulations or maybe the enforcement of regulations in a lot of these regions as it relates to water. Um, should companies be doing more to support public policies that actually address some of these key environmental risks, whether it's groundwater depletion or climate change? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jerry? Policy in water stewardship is going to be important, and I think there's a couple of key considerations in putting that together as we think about the collaboration in any water watershed. Um, the first is, as Nathan mentioned before, context is really important. Each watershed is different. And so any policy approach, any regulatory approach is going to need to take that into consideration. The second is that policy really needs to live up to three key criteria. It needs to be effective. So it's got to solve the problem. It's got to make sure that we have good quality, clean, fresh water well into the future. Um, it needs to be efficient. It needs to enable um, innovation to really solve some of these major challenges. And a lot of that has to do with being outcome focused as opposed to solution focused. We love market-based solutions because it enables great efficiency. And the third criteria is it needs to be proportionate, meaning that everybody who has an impact needs to be contributing to the solution in some form or another. Um, so it needs to not pick winners and losers, but really look at how we can get everyone who is part of the impact and part of the need uh, for the future can contribute to the solution. So I think it will be important, uh, but it's got to be effective, efficient, and proportionate. Thanks, Jerry, for that. Um, we, we have a question that I think is also a good one for you, Jerry. Um, it comes in from James, and, and he is asking, um, how, how do you consider, you know, maybe across the business, um, capital funding as it relates to water conservation projects? Um, do plants in your high-risk areas get priority? Do they have to follow the same kind of ROR targets to, to other capital investments? Or there, is there some way for you to make sure that you're getting uh, conservation projects in your own facilities targeted to the places that really need them? It's a, that's a great question, and he's exactly on the, James is exactly on the, the, the right tools that we use. Um, areas, facilities um, that have, that are in areas that are, are of greater water stress um, clearly get priority. Um, 
and there's different. We look at different ways of um, return um, in areas where it's absolutely critical that we have water efficiency. Um, those aren't held to the same level of, of return because it really is just a, a requirement for operation. Um, so there are, there are varying ways that we look at, at areas that have um, high risk to make sure that we're addressing them in the priority that they need to be and that we're addressing them effectively. Great. Um, and then I have a, some questions that have come in about some tools, tools questions. So one question, um, Ellen, was what are the water risk tools you guys actually used to conduct your assessment? Uh, and then another question was about the, um, the, the, the water action hub. Uh, do you find it useful? Um, what, what do you, what's the purpose of it? Maybe explain a little bit about that. Well, let, let me start with the second question first, and then I probably am going to hand this over to Nathan to talk a little bit more about the tools that TNC in particular used for our global assessment. The Water Action Hub has been a very helpful um, agent for us to get started, especially in California. Uh, we were just beginning to start our understanding of California to, to uh, start that deep dive assessment of the state watersheds. When the Water Action Hub called a water meeting for a number of stakeholders um, throughout the area, and we were invited um, as, as guests, and Kari Wiegerstahl, one of Nathan's colleagues, and I attended, and that's really what kicked off the continuing discussion between a group of predominantly agribusiness um, related organizations, consumer goods organizations, as well as suppliers. We've been having monthly calls to talk about how can we work together in the state, first trying to understand where everybody's working, what everybody's working on, and then identifying those, those points of overlap. We're early in that journey. We have not initiated a particular project together yet, but that is the hope for that um, group in the future. Um, some of the, the recent tools that are coming out that I'll point people to, um, the Nature Conservancy actually launched an urban blue, water blueprint tool this week, which you'll be able to find online and take a look at cities where your facilities are located. It's a, it's a big, big step. It um, addresses uh, city water quality a little bit more than water quantity. So you will need to go into additional tools, and there are tools that um, World Wildlife Fund has, has developed that I'm going to ask Nathan to talk about. But I will also call out the recently developed True Cost tool for water, water monetization, which gives you yet another lens on water risk in various geographies. Um, we can make sure those resources are available um, you know, via an email, we can send out links to some of those resources for you. And I'm going to give it to Nathan to talk a little bit more about the global assessment. Sure. Thanks, Ellen. So in regard to the specific tools, so for, for the work that we're doing with General Mills, we're, we're kind of leveraging a, a variety of tools. So Ellen mentioned one of them, the WWF, Water Risk Filter Tool. We've also looked used a little bit Aqueduct. We also have our, our own models and uh, water balance models that, from affiliates of TNC that we've used for our work. And we also have our own climate change data and other sorts of data sources. But generally, you know, these are these are global scoping tools, and I think it's important to emphasize they are just tools. And so, really, when you start to get down to that important operating unit of the watershed or the basin, that the challenges can oftentimes look really quite different. Uh, Ellen just mentioned the urban water blueprint, which is one of our kind of attempts at trying to get a better picture of uh, looking at the global scale of what exactly are the water challenges. And the reason why that, that particular project has been has been uh, important is that instead of just looking at the enclosing or um, basins within which is within which a, a facility is located, we're actually looking at source watersheds, and that's a, that's a really important and, and key distinction when you're looking at particularly water supply risk. So I recognize that we're at the top of the hour here, so I'm, uh, I'll just end it there. <laughs> yeah, and I think what we're going to do right now, folks, we're going to keep on for another five minutes with a few of the questions because they have so many good questions that have come in. Uh, if you need to jump off, um, please keep in mind that we will be sending you a recording of this uh, webinar and also a list of resources afterwards. So thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to go back to a, these folks with a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, so one question that just came in from Monica, Jerry, was 
Are, are investors, um, shareholders, lenders, are they interested in the water risks that you guys are looking at yourselves and in how you're managing these issues? Um, and if not, you know, what role could investors play to help support what you're doing? Yeah, I think, uh, I think they are increasingly interested uh, because fundamentally investors are interested in the stable operation of a company. And so, as I mentioned before, if we don't have water, we don't have ingredients. Um, so we uh, have uh, conversations regularly with investors about what we're doing in this area, and I think they'll continue to support that. Um, I just want to build on one thing that, that Nathan said and, and make one additional point about the tools that we have used over time. Um, any work like this, which is at such scale and in such new areas um, and in such great detail, requires development over time. And Nathan mentioned some of the WWF tools, and our journey on this really started with an initial assessment that WWF did of about a half a dozen of our growing regions in the U.S. And that led to the development of, of some of the tools that they have provided. So I just wanted to point out that this is a journey. It takes many stakeholders along the way, and all of them have been uh, valuable contributors and continue to be valuable contributors to this work. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much. And I'll just put to you one more question um, that I think is, it gets back to kind of the heart of, of you know, how to – work with growers and motivate change. This comes from Steve, and he asks, as you work with growers to improve practices, how do you address perceived or real risk to profit and crop quality and yield that growers have uh, when, when they're being asked to, to think about changing their practices? That's a great question. The, and the thing that we've been trying to do in um, the work in field to market is to demonstrate the link between sustainable choices and profitability. And it doesn't take much, quite honestly, once um, farmers understand uh, the impact of the water choices that they're making. Farmers are the great economists of the world. They manage to pennies per bushel. And so use of water most times requires, uh, if they're not paying for the water directly, um, requires the use of energy to apply it to their fields. And so there's definitely costs associated with it. They also see um, with some of the uh, continuing developments of water efficiency technology, the value of precise irrigation technology that allows them to apply water in exactly the right place in exactly the right quantity. Um, and so helping them make choices that not only improves their stewardship, but allows them to be more profitable and more productive, that's the win-win that we continue to seek. Thanks, Jerry. And um, this is a, you know, a very important area for all of us who are working on agricultural supply chain and sustainability issues to continue to move forward. Um, I want to thank everyone um, who's joined us today. It's been a really great turnout with really smart questions, and I apologize if we weren't able to get to all of them. I want to especially thank our speakers, Ellen, Jerry, and Nathan for joining us um, and providing such great content and reflections. And I want to just make sure everyone um, has as a resource some um, of these tools that were mentioned today. Um, I'm sure there, there might be follow-up questions. Um, we will try our best to answer them. And again, thank you so much for your time and joining us.